Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest today is Tom Crockett. Welcome, Tom. Welcome. Thank you for uh, for having me here. Any uh, distant relation to Davy? Matter of fact, he's a great, great, great grand uncle. Very so. cool. <laughs> <laughs> we go way back here in Virginia. Yeah, I have a friend that I attended the uh, Science and Non-Duality conference with. It's the grand nephew of Harry Houdini. So uh, that's wow, kind of, I kept threatening to lock him in the car trunk and <laughs> see if he could get well, out. I dare you to get out. I dare you. <laughs> Good. Well, speaking of the Sand Conference, I I first became aware of you at that conference. I uh, hadn't really known about you before that. Um, and I saw this nice brochure that you had put together about your presentation with Scott Kilby and Jeff Foster. And so I read that and I thought, definitely want to attend this presentation because it was kind of a very up my alley in terms of the, the sort of stuff that I find myself questioning and talking to people about in these interviews. Um, I think there's a, a need for a growing up or maturation in the sort of non-dual world that, that I see happening actually. Just just yesterday I got an email from Mandy Sulk who I had interviewed a year or two ago and at that time she was saying you know there is no person, there's nothing to do and all this and yesterday she said boy have I changed. <laughs> I said I realized there's a whole lot to do and I've gone through you know big transformation since uh, we last talked so I'm going to interview Mandy again. But I, I walked into your interview uh, about t five minutes late after it started and I was immediately captivated by what you were saying, um, and, and your slide presentation was was very humorous <laughs> and informative. So I want to talk about that stuff with you, uh, but I'd also, you know, it's, it's kind of nice to start with a little bit of a biographical sketch of the person, because otherwise the listeners don't know who it is we're talking to here, and you know, what are your credentials for saying whatever we're going to say, and, and so on. So perhaps we could go back a little bit to, uh, you know, just a, maybe a chronological biographical sketch of how you ended up where you are today, you know, in terms of your spiritual orientation to life. Of course, you're assuming I know who you're talking to today. Yeah, right. <laughs> would be a prerequisite for my explaining who you're listening to. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, on that one, I would, I would suggest that, you know, there's always more to know and greater depth and clarity to be discovered. Yeah. Um, gosh. Um, you know, I, I'm going to have the deer caught in the headlights look in this, you know, like, because in some ways, I'm not really sure where to start. Um, well, let me prime the pump a little bit. For, for okay. instance, uh, I read your entire book cover to cover. Uh, and I, uh, and in it, you in the epilogue, actually, you, you talked about how you had studied shamanism, you had had experiences with ayahuasca and mushrooms, uh, you made references to Buddhism that made it sound like you had been a practitioner. You uh, have done a lot of dream work, you mm -hmm. know, studying or analyzing dreams. You have been counseling people, presumably with dream work and maybe other things. So I, I kind of got little snapshots of various things you've been interested in, but it didn't really present a, a complete picture necessarily, if, there, if that's possible. I, I think probably the complete picture or as complete a picture as I've probably for most of my adult life, if not parts of my childhood, I've actually been very interested in this question of why we suffer, mm -hmm. um, why we feel the things we feel kind of in this realm. And, um, you know, the first thing I discovered was not non-duality or emptiness teachings. The first thing I, uh, you know, probably, uh, probably discovered were um, uh, traditional indigenous wisdom teachings. Um, and that path of spirituality, I actually have a Master of Fine Art degree from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and I went there in the early 80s after four years in the Navy. Um, and what I realized after getting a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in art was that I really wanted to be untrained, uh, which you can't go back. <laughs> you can't go back and be untrained, but I was actually much more interested in the... Um, the collections in places like the Field Museum of uh, indigenous artifacts and, and objects. And um, and so I began to say, well, I can't be untrained, but maybe I can look untrained, and actually began to create objects, uh, artifacts that, that looked, for all intents and purposes, like um, traditional spiritual 
paraphernalia or objects from other cultures. And then in order to, um, to, to sell those or show those in, in galleries, I created the culture that went with them and created the stories that went with them and, and kind of tongue in cheek, but also, you know, it, it was a kind of exploration for me. And, and people would buy these things with my little made up story about my little made up culture and and then would come back to me and say you know I, I gave this to a friend in the hospital and you said this was a healing you know this was a healing object and and it really worked and I went whoa that it wasn't supposed to really <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not a shaman I'm not any of those things but it led me to study uh, to to want to know why those things might work and um, and that led me to a, a long exploration into shamanism and indigenous wisdom teachings and plant spirit medicine things like that and then through whatever evolution process you know I experienced in my own life it began to feel like um, I could make a difference for someone in the short term I could I could do something that would have an impact on their pain or suffering for in the short term, but it would always come back. Mm. And, and that always coming back, that always circling back made me feel like, okay, this is just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. There's got to be something deeper, more profound than this. And that led me probably most directly to emptiness teachings, uh, oneness teachings, non-duality. Um, I, I don't know if that's a coherent story. It is. I mean, it's a very concise one. Uh, I'm sure there are all kinds of adventures along the way with ayahuasca and mushrooms and all that stuff, which you're welcome to talk about if you feel it's relevant. But, um, you know, it's a nice little synopsis. I think the um, probably more than anything else, the mushrooms... Uh, which were done in Mexico, um, up in Huautla, in the mountains, with a traditional healer um, who basically dedicated his life to working with these things in ceremony, in a sacred container, um, was pretty profound for me, because it really gave me a glimpse of the territory. It gave me a sense of where I was heading. And after having been a, a meditator most of my life and having had little glimpses into that that state of ultimate freedom, uh, emptiness, um, connectedness at the same time. Uh, the mushrooms sort of did it in a way that, uh, I don't know, probably stayed with me more profoundly. Mm. Any particular experience you can elaborate on? <clears throat> um, probably, I mean, my first experience with with mushrooms was with a group of people and um, and, and honestly, um, I was such a egoically inflated being <laughs> going into this ceremony that I thought, um, what I'm going to do is be a journalist here. I'm going to actually have the, take the mushrooms, you know, given to me by the, the shaman, you know, who decides how much you're supposed to have. And I'm going to, I'm going to have a partial cool experience while being enough of a journalist to be able to write this story as I, as I go. Mm. Um, and I remember, you know, in this ceremony, you, there's, there's a lot of preparation. Then you take the mushrooms and then they gradually begin to blow out candles in the room until it becomes dark. And I, and they said, you know, we encourage you to lay down. And, and I said, I'm not laying down. I'm going to sit up in a chair because I'm only going to have a, like a partial experience. This is going to be under my control. Uh -huh. And I remember thinking at some point, it was almost like Pac-Man. Like the mushrooms were like gobbling up every trace of ego <laughs> that I had left. And, and, my, and my little scared ego was trying to hide out in different places of my body going, you know, no, no, I can get away from this. I can, I can still <laughs> hold on and be me, be who I thought I was. It mm. won't affect me. Um, and, and then literally just like sinking from the chair to the floor and um, and so many profound and probably the most profound experience from the the mushrooms was a recognition that at some point 
um, I began to sob. I began to cry. Um, I felt an incredible sadness that was both personal and, and impersonal. It was not so much my sadness. It was because I had nothing, I, I wasn't triggered by anything that I was feeling sad about, except every sad thing in my life, you know, up to that point. But it was like sticking your toe in the ocean of sadness. Hmm. Like the, it's this w huge ocean of emotion. And, and I was just feeling it. And everybody in the room began, you know, was sobbing. And then at some point we all began laughing huh. and it was, and again, it came from nothing, no sonic trigger, no programming. The, the songs the healer was singing were in uh, uh, Mazatec, which, you know, you can't even, you have to have a Spanish translator and then into an English for, for any of us would understood what he was saying. But um, it, you know, was then humor. And then it was like these full body orgasms where you were just going, oh God. Oh, these wave after wave. But again, it wasn't me. It wasn't mine. I didn't own this. It was, um, and and to the extent that I wanted to cling to it, um, every so often the healer would go. He would let us do, you know, go through these waves of emotion, and then say, you know, tranquilo, tranquilo, calm, you know, come calm, calm down, come back, like let it go now, let it go. Um, and I think that was pretty profound in my teaching and my work with other people about to the extent that we cling to identities, the extent that we cling to these emotions that we have, that's where suffering comes from. Because hmm. they're meant to move. They're, we're meant to feel them. It's not like we're meant to feel nothing. Um, and that's not, I don't believe that's the goal of enlightenment or awakening or awareness that we we get to bypass all feeling. Um, you know, you started out by talking about the friend who said, boy, have I changed, you know, in the past year. And, and I think there's, for me, like nothing more profound than the simple line, you know, first there is a mountain, then there is no mountain, then there is. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, to a large extent, the non-dual community is filled with a lot of people who are at the, then there is, there is no mountain stage. And it's just a stage. Yeah. You know. We're going to go into the whole non-dual thing at length. So I could ask you a question about that now, but I think I'll put that off because I, I, sure. it'll probably form a major portion of this discussion. Um, so that was very interesting. I'm glad I had you tell that story. Um, I imagine a lot of people who listen to it are thinking, hmm, I think I'll go to Mexico and take some mushrooms. <laughs> this, this sounds good. Uh, is that the kind of thing you would still recommend or is it? you know, really a, kind of a reckless thing to do in some respects. I think what's hard is that um, a lot of people, a lot of people have had experiences with mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what they describe is a very, um, you know, a very cool, you know, mind altering experience. But when, um, you know, for a number of years, I would lead groups to Mexico. And I worked with a, a depth psychologist who lived in Mexico City and had a retreat center in Oaxaca. And we would spend, you know, we would go for 10, eight to 10 days at a time. And the first four or five of those days was altering diet. It was doing sweat lodges. It was cleansing. It was doing intense sessions of dream work to uncover why are you ta even taking these mushrooms? Because they're meant to be a cleansing, a healing experience. Right. Um, you're me it's meant to it's not meant to be a recreational cool experience. Right. And so we would prepare for it. We would go up and basically turn ourselves over to a healer, to someone who'd spent their life um, learning the ceremonies and, and how to work with these and who takes the mushrooms almost, you know, every day, every time they do ceremony, they take the mushrooms as well. Mm -hmm. And yet are capable of not losing themselves in the experience, but guiding you through the experience. You know, one of the things that was funny about the experience was that um, the healer, our names were too strange for him. You know, Western names were too strange for him, so he gave us numbers. You know, and you know, so there was numero uno and numero dos, and and I, I was number two. I was numero dos, and every so often, 
you know, what I most wanted was to be left alone, <laughs> floating in the, you know, pool of infinite cosmic consciousness. And, you know, just, oh, my God, just leave me here. This is bliss. This is, ah, oh, this is amazing. And I would hear from far away, numero uno, si, numero dos, numero dos, <laughs> numero <laughs> dos. And I'd go, no, I don't even want to answer. And then I'd hear the other people in the group say, Tom, you got to say something. <laughs> <laughs> but his whole point was no one gets left behind. Yeah. So he was afraid that people might get so checked out that they would lose c c connection with this world or something and it could be well, dangerous or some such thing. Not, not so much dangerous, but he had a job to do. Yeah. And his job was was to cleanse you to clear you of blockages and things like that mm -hmm. and you know unless you stayed and kept up in a way with the process in other words if you got lost in that um that floating in that cosmic consciousness i don't think i ever would have had the experience of the emotional flow moving through me that wasn't me uh -huh. that for so much of my life i had claimed as me you know this is my my identity is my emotions my identity is is everything I feel and how I feel about everything I feel. That's who I am. But if I hadn't had the experience, if I had stayed floating in this, you know, I would have had this amazing blissful experience to talk about, but I wouldn't have had the, you know, okay, this is you and it's not you. Yeah. Experience. And, for, and I had no conversation with him. I didn't know at that time. That's what I needed to know. But apparently that's what, you know, and I would have lost that if I had been, able to do just what I wanted to do. So when that comes back to the question, you know, should you just go to Mexico and take some mushrooms? If you can have a kind of experience in a container like that, I think it can be profound. But it's a harder thing to find <laughs> that kind of experience. Yeah, I mean, you just call up the Mexican Tourism Bureau and say, <laughs> hey, hey, I want to go take mushrooms and they give you some pointers or, or is it even legal? Uh, it, well, as a matter of fact, it's not legal, uh -huh. but um, you know, it starts after dark, and we were in a house um, up in Huautla in the mountains, and probably about midnight, there's a banging on the gate, and it's the local police mm. who know where these things are going on, and they, and you know, the owner goes down, and he gives them a little money, and they say, is everything okay? And he says, yeah, everything's okay, because what they really want is no trouble. Right. They don't want tourists coming up and being ripped off or killed or something like that by unscrupulous people. Yeah. And so they're kind of making these rounds. They know completely well what's going on in there. Mm. And technically it's illegal. But what they but they also know that this is what the people do up there. <laughs> so, and is, is this a part of Mexico where the cartels aren't very active or something? Or? Yeah, there's not a whole lot of money in mushrooms. Uh, right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there, there wasn't. I actually stopped leading trips for a couple of reasons, but one of the reasons was that it was just getting kind of dicey to travel in Mexico. So. Yeah. Yeah. And so, what kind of lasting effect did this have on you? Um. I, I think it gave me a sense. You know, I had said before, having spent so much time learning techniques learning um, uh, techniques and processes that it kind of took me to a place of what's deeper than techniques and processes. You had been what, studying Buddhism and getting those Buddhism, kind of techniques? You know, uh, Buddhism and shamanism, yeah. uh, um, um, you know, meditation, techniques for altering consciousness, but techniques for moving energy, techniques for um, studying dreams, understanding what, you know, what dreams mean in someone's life and um, and had spent a lot of time doing the kind of work of, of, of understanding the content of dreams. And, and it actually took me, I, I kind of went back and said, maybe it isn't the content of the dreams. Maybe it's the phenomenon of dreaming that is really what's important here. Maybe it's the dialogue between the egoic, what we call waking self, and the deep dreamless sleep or you know the kind of non-dual self maybe maybe the um the act of dreaming maybe the the phenomenon of dreams the fact that in a dream you can dream as yourself and be conscious of this is me 
you can also glance in a mirror and realize this is is not me this is an old woman or you know i'm an animal now um, so you can dream as something other than you and you can also dream as as this you can dream as though you're watching a movie and we've all had those you know different kinds of experiences of dreaming and we move we can move seamlessly back and forth through those things um, so the phenomenon of dreaming then becomes a kind of pointing out instruction to waking up, to really waking up. Um, you can talk about the fact that um, things in dreams m become like you can be riding a bike and all of a sudden you're r driving a car. And there was no transition between riding bike and driving car. And for a moment, a flash, there's kind of like a, huh, but you don't stop the dream. You don't go, wait a minute, stop. You you don't you don't stop the the dream. You you incorporate that new information, and now you're driving a car. Well, you know, so often I think what causes suffering for us is when is that we have this kind of script or story that we think should be happening, and something different happens, and we say to life, stop, S stop moving. Everybody, stop. Wait, this isn't how it should go, and we suffer. You know, and that's what, in, in, in dreams, you don't do that. In dreams, you simply go, okay, this is what's arising now. How do I, you know, how do I address what's arising now? You look at nightmares. You look at dreams of frustration, uh, inability to, like, you're, you're someplace and you're trying to find your way back. Right. You know? like, like the class that you're supposed to be attending in high school and you, you realize that you've been forget, forgetting it all semester long and you're running around the halls looking for it. <laughs> exactly. You know, and I mean, for me, a classic anxiety dream is packing. Right. Like I'm, I'm always about to catch a plane and, and I'm in a hotel and I've got to pack a suitcase and suddenly I've got like stuff, trunks and trunks <laughs> of stuff and, and I'm going like, okay, how do I get this? <laughs> this isn't yeah. work. How am I going to get on a plane? You know, what am I? I can't leave my stuff, but I can't move <laughs> forward without my stuff. Uh, and again, as a pointing out instruction, I think about, you know, how much of my stuff am I really like shackled to? Interesting. So that's how you would interpret that kind of a dream, yeah. Well, again, I could interpret it specifically for what may be a specific thing going on in my life. But I can also talk about it generally in terms of the phenomena of those kind of dreams and how they're pointing me toward waking up, mm. really waking up. Mm -hmm. So interesting, yeah. So we kind of we kind of segued into dreams, and we you mentioned one other thing which I want to get back to the conclusion of your mushroom story. But uh, you mentioned about suffering, and you also mentioned that earlier in the interview. And I've heard this interpretation very often that. You know, there's a difference between pain and suffering. Suffering is when we attach meaning to pain or, you know, a story mm -hmm. to it or we want it to be something other than what it is. But, I mean, if an animal who doesn't spin stories gets its leg caught in a steel trap and chews its paw off, you know, in order to free itself, is not is that pure, simple pain? Or is there, you know, I mean, is, an animal, is the animal really suffering or is it just a matter of semantics and how we define these words? I, I, think, a, I think a certain amount of it is semantic in, in how we're defining the term and we use the term pain and suffering so much in the same sentence like you know what you know legal terms you know it's like right. an award for pain and suffering um, I, I think the difference is that I mean I, I actually tell the story about my dog you know um, German Shepherd um, who's in the backyard right now um, because she otherwise would be on camera <laughs> uh, um, if I step on her paw, mm -hmm. it hurts her, right. and she squeals, and you know, and and will limp, you know, just long enough for the pain to go away. She's not clinging to the pain. She's also not clinging to the idea that I'm, you know, I'm trying to hurt her. It's simply she's reacting to the pain she's in, and whatever she has to do to react to the pain she's in in that moment, she will until you know until the pain goes away or until the situation changes and then she's back to her like 
okay, love me, love me. You know, like, like, yeah, but if you play. if you willfully hurt her and did it regularly, as some people do to animals, uh, eventually she would, you know, fear you and cower in the corner when you came around and be in a you know kind of a messed up psychological state. I've, I've dealt with you know shelter dogs and mm -hmm. who who have in fact we, our dog was in that condition when we first adopted her, so. Um, you know, and I, I don't know. And so there you have a kind of an instance of psychological abnormality that's been developed through abuse. And um, well, but you know, then what you're, you know, what you're, what you're probably talking about is um, it, it, the the thing that animals can share with humans in that sense is conditioning. You know, being conditioned to respond in a certain way. Right. And you know. I suppose you could argue that suffering is a conditioned response. Mm. Um, you know, um, you could beat a dog so that it its habitual response, its conditioned response, is fear, um, and you wouldn't have to hit it. You would just have to be present or yell or glare, and the dog would would re react in anticipation of pain. Um, now, I could go ahead and hit the dog, and that would actually create pain, which would in that case reinforce the conditioned response of suffering, but I wouldn't necessarily need to because, um, you know, a big part of the suffering at that point is simply the conditioning. So, I don't know if that's an answer. Right. Um, well, yeah. So translating all this into practical terms for those who are listening, um, what what would the takeaway on this be? Well, I just think that it's useful to think about breaking those two things apart mm -hmm. and saying that um, it, you know it's. Uh, I don't want to demonize someone for suffering. On the other hand. Um, I don't want to give someone the sense that, well, gosh, if you just get enlightened, you know, if you just let me point out how unenlightened you are until you become enlightened, you will no longer have pain. Right. You'll no longer experience pain. Um, I don't know that it's true that you'll no longer ever experience suffering, but you will be less likely to convert your pain into suffering. There were stories about Ramana Maharshi, you know, screaming in pain as he was dying of cancer and people being all concerned and upset and, you know, and, and he, he, he saying basically something like, hey, I'm cool, don't, don't worry about me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, or, um, you know, one of my favorite stories, and, and again, I, I, I will just paraphrase the story, is the, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the spiritual teacher whose, you know, s child dies. And, you know, and they feel that pain and they express that pain. And there are students who say, you know, I thought you were beyond, you know, that. That's not what you get beyond. You don't get beyond feeling the feelings of this realm. Um, you know, on the other hand, if it's three years from now and you've locked yourself in a room and, you know, you know, and, and refuse to deal with people because the world took your child from you. Um, you have a certain responsibility for that, you know, for clinging to that, for not letting it move. Yeah. You know, one of the pieces, um, I, I wrote a book called Stone Age Wisdom, The Healing Principles of Shamanism, and it was really looking at the fact that our Stone Age ancestors had a worldview um, that was based on, on five principles, that the world is alive conscious, moving, interrelated, and responsive. And, you know, and that third one, that principle that the, that the world is moving, is where the, the shamanic or indigenous traditional um, ideas of, of where disease comes from. It's when you stop something from moving. Mm. Um, and if you think about the, the emotional diseases, the emotional suffering we have, it's usually because we're we're trying to stop something from happening. You know, we're trying to cling to it. Like, I don't want this to change. I want, I want the woman I've met and, you know, fell in love with to stay exactly as she was then. Mm -hmm. 
um, which is unreasonable and, and impossible. <laughs> um, and, and I want, uh, you know, I want this feeling I'm feeling now uh, to go away or else I cling to it because it gives me a righteous feeling of, you know, um, of identity, you know, that, uh, you know, I am the one, the suffering one. I'm the one who suffers on everyone else's behalf and, 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 you know, heals or cures or helps everybody. Well, you know, you were saying that when you went for that mushroom experience and you had some ego there and you thought, I am going to sit in the chair, um, you know, you were trying to control the situation. You wanted it on your terms. Yes. And I think that's what you're pointing to in a larger sense. It's um, really there's a much vaster intelligence orchestrating the universe. And we usurp its authority or, or its, its, uh, its authorship when we insist on having, you know, things on our terms <laughs> rather than exactly. on. Yeah. And which is not to say that we should become a kind of a, a blob and just say uh, whatever, you know, just f totally go with the flow to the extent we don't have any volition or, or intentionality. But there's a kind of a, a, a natural balance that can be achieved in, in which there, there is that intentionality, but it's kind of in, in tune with uh, the, 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 the bigger picture, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you're getting at something that's probably really critical also in the community or the discussion when we begin talking about what enlightenment is. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the first myths is that you'll never feel pain again. Right. Uh, you know, but you notice that the people who, you know, in order not to feel pain again, it's like you have to shut down all emotion. You don't feel joy. You don't feel, you know, you don't feel, you, you have to like narrow the window yeah. so much for what you feel um, that it's hard to relate to you. I mean, it's, it's hard for other people to relate to you. So, you know, so one of those myths is that you won't feel. Um, the other one is, it, it, um, it actually just went out of my head, but it was what you were talking about before. Um, oh gosh. You... Well, I'll, I'll help you out here. I, I, I kind of, my wife is in Detroit right now visiting Ama, the hugging saint. And uh, she's kind of fascinating to watch. She'll she'll sit on her couch for you know umpteen hours just blessing people one by mm -hmm. one, and um, and she's kind of like Mark Twain said about the weather in Connecticut. And if, if you don't like it, wait a few minutes. But because you know, <laughs> uh, you'll see her go through this vast range of emotions without any attachment. You know there could yeah. be anger one minute and tears streaming down her face the next minute and uproarious laughter the next minute, and you know uh, there's this kind of complete spontaneity with with what presents itself to her and at the same time I know her to be a very determined you know accomplishing kind of person you know just very like a, a force to be re reckoned with that accomplishes huge and, things and I think that was exactly that helped because I was the other piece that is kind of a myth is you know so once you're enlightened you won't do anything anymore right 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 you know that you will just like sit in the wisdom of your enlightenment right. and um, you know most of us have to make a living you know most of us have to uh, go to jobs or work with people or things like that and to a certain extent there's a there's an aspect of what passes for kind of non-dual teaching um, that doesn't touch on the reality of life yeah. much at all. It works fine in Facebook groups, um, <laughs> you know, as as discussion points. But when it's you actually have to go out and do things in the world, how helpful is it? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, let's kind of morph into a discussion about that segue. I should say into a discussion about that because uh, there's a lot of interesting points we can cover, and there are a lot of things that were in your presentation. Um, maybe for starters, you, since you've used the word enlightenment a couple times, um, you could give me a definition of what you understand it to be. Um, I, I actually not sure I could tell you what I think it is, or or um, I think what's more interesting to me is is how when I hear people talk about it they often talk about things that seem so different. Different than um, what? 
Um, well, different from how one person talks about it to how another person. Oh, I see. Talks. Well, yeah, that's why I asked the question yeah. because it's it's one of those words which, you know, I don't feel there's there's a really clear consensus in the collective understanding, uh, you uh -huh. know, about what it actually means. Nor do I feel there's a clear consensus about what the various stages of its development are. And so you have all kinds of people at various stages, in my opinion, who feel they've reached the sort of the, the peak of the mountain, who mm -hmm. may be actually in the big picture of things just getting started, you know. And, and uh, <laughs> so I think there needs to be greater clarity, and we'll probably evolve into this over the coming years in the general spiritual community about, you know, what is the goal, if we want to call it a goal? What actually are we talking about? And what are the sort of expected um, uh, vistas along the, the, the route to it? Yeah, and I, or, may, or maybe there's many routes with many vistas, but you know, there, there's a big mishmash right now in terms of yeah, and I, under, yeah. because I think you hear people talking about a, a li enlightenment, awakening, realization in a way that um, you know some people talk about it, and it's instant. It's a light switch. You flip it on, and that's it. It's you're good to go. You right. never go back. It's right. per it's instant and it's permanent. And yet other people talk about it as a gradual almost stepped process where you have an experience and then you have to stabilize and, and then there's an experience and you stabilize. There's something that you're constantly moving toward or moving, you know, or uh, that's unfolding, the that's, lotus blossom. That's been my orientation. Um, I, uh, I interviewed a guy a couple of years ago, fairly early on when I was doing this and, uh, you know, he said, "Well, I'm awakened. It's it seems to be perpetual. Everything's groovy." And then about a few months ago, he said, "Please take my interview down. You know, I am lost. I, I it wasn't stable. I don't. You know, I, I'm still I've still got a lot of work to do." Yeah, and I, I think that's amazingly honest. Yeah, I mean, I I wish more people would do that. You know, I wish more. You know, one of the reasons I'm always so impressed with Jeff Foster is you know that capacity he has to say, um, you know, I was so right <laughs> and so full of shit yeah yeah um you know um about where i was i mean i think that's much more helpful and that was one of the things we talked about in that talk you know so would you you know would you listen to a teacher who said you know i've had what you've had and i'm here to tell you there's more um you know or do you have to have the teacher who said you know i'm done I'm at the pinnacle, I'm at the peak, so you can listen to everything I have to say and know that it's permanent, unchanging, you know, like unchanging truth. Yeah. Well, you know, the when somebody says there's more, there's a certain crowd that doesn't like to hear that because there are other teachers who have popularized the notion that seeking is 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 the bugaboo and that you ha that you know you should just give up the search and this whole dangling carrot idea that you can keep moving on towards a brighter future takes you out of the now and you know f leaves you in a perpetual state of dissatisfaction which which <laughs> is true and and that's the i think that's where the problem is that 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 all of these things these truisms in non-duality are true there's yeah. truth behind them and there is truth behind the fact that some people get um, stuck in a loop loop of seeking, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm not sure it's the seeking that's fundamentally the problem. It's that the form that seeking takes is when I come up against the part of me that is most resistant you know, or that I'm most resistant to letting go of, that I'm most clinging to, um, and and I come up face to face with a teacher who either mirrors back to me work I still have to do, or um, or out and out suggests that I'm not as enlightened as I think I am. Um, you know, then we look for another teacher huh. or another teaching. Um, so um, so is seeking keeping us stuck? Yeah, but is is it actually the seeking, or is it seeking as a response to what I don't really want to deal with? Yeah. Do I want to find another teacher, another workshop, another path, because um, this path is, it, you know, this is hard, or I don't want to do this. And in, in my own path, what has transpired is that I went through years of of this sort of agonizing 
oh god you know i'm i'm i've got to have it and i'm i'll be miserable until i do and you know just yearning kind of striving kind of thing and then eventually it, it sort of it shifted to a more you know content this is fine just the way it is it, it really it was a dropping of the seeking and yet at the very same time i readily acknowledged that i probably have vast range of uh development yet to undergo and explore and and that's that's not discouraging in the least that's exciting it's like oh boy i get to do all that you know yeah. <laughs> and yet but there's no longer the orientation of of um dissatisfaction and and desperation yeah and you know another one of those truisms is um you know that comes with stop seeking is you know do nothing right you know you're perfect as you are yeah the problem i find with that is again in the hands of the right teacher at the right moment it may be just the right thing that a person needs to hear but it becomes um a kind of cliche that's supposed to be an answer to every problem that someone you know that and there is no you right you know, become the the <laughs> double whammy you know that the, you can you know whack the head of the ego mole as soon as it comes out of the hole but it, it's not it's not useful right i mean if you say that to a room full of people what's going to be the result i mean either they're going to be frustrated because they feel like well I don't, I don't have what he has but nonetheless he says i should just give up and and not do anything or they're going to think well okay fine there's nothing to do and i've already got it and uh and then walk get up on a soapbox and start talking to people about how they already have it like jeff used to do right. <laughs> by by his own admission yeah uh, you know, or they become lazy. You know, I mean, because there really is work to be done. And yet, if you get indoctrinated with the notion that there's nothing to do, you know, why not? Why not just sit on the couch and crack a beer and watch football and 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 have a notion of non-duality and think you're enlightened? Yeah, and that doing the the other problem with doing nothing is that most people are doing nothing. Yeah, and it's not working for them. Right. You know, because. Because most of the behaviors we have, the habitual egoic behaviors we have, came from some experience we had, after which, and I, I, I use kind of an analogy of, so you're young, you're happy, you know, you're walking down the street, and out of nowhere someone comes up and punches you in the stomach, and it wins you, and it knocks the breath out of you, and it causes you pain. That experience of being punched in the stomach is like me stepping on my dog's paw. Um, it doesn't fundamentally change the dog. It doesn't fundamentally change you. What fundamentally changes you is the moment after that punch, you say, I am never going to be taken by surprise like that again. Mm -hmm. So you tense up your stomach, ready for the next person who's going to come punch you in the stomach. And for days and weeks and months, you practice being tense, being prepared, clenched for that punch in the stomach. And you practice it so much that like any good practice, one day you're not practicing anymore. It's just part of who you are. You were walking around clenched, you know, anticipating that punch in the stomach. So then you encounter the spiritual teacher who says, um, you know, uh, you know, your problem is you just need to, you know, relax, stop, you know, do nothing. Well, I'm doing nothing now. Yeah. Because I've forgotten that I habitually caused that, you know, that I made it a practice to clench to the point where I don't know that I'm clenching. For you to tell me to relax, I'm not conscious that I'm the one clenching. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you actually have to take me through a practice where I can experience my clenching so that I know what to unclench. So sometimes it takes a practice, a conscious practice, to replace what's become an unconscious practice. And simply saying, you know, you just need to do nothing well, that's what it feels like I'm doing now. I'm doing nothing because yeah. I have forgotten that I practiced this so long that I made it a habitual practice of mine. Very good. I like that metaphor. Um, and, you know, to my, in my experience and understanding, there are layers upon layers upon layers of clenching, to use your word. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, there are deep, um, you know, bond, bonds, I guess the word would be, that bind us um, that we're not even aware of. And they've piled up upon, uh, upon one another for God knows how long. <laughs> yeah. And they don't, you, 
there's nothing, virtually nothing anyone can do, I believe, to instantly release them all and find yourself totally free. And probably if you did so, you'd be about, you'd be institutionalized because you wouldn't be able to function. So there really needs to be a, a sort of a, I hate to say it, but a gradual um, unbinding or unclenching or relaxing, as you say. And, yeah. and probably you and I have both experienced. I know I have times when there was suddenly a big release. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize the extent to which I had been gripped in that particular way, but I suddenly found like felt like a, a shackles had been taken off. Yeah. Uh, so there was this unconscious bondage, suddenly and, dissolved. But it wasn't the end of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. But it would be very easy for for someone to tell you or for you to conflate in your mind that moment, that that peak experience moment of going, oh my God, you know, I'm I'm. I, I've been doing this to myself for so long and now I can just not do it to myself and you know this must be what enlightenment feels like um, you know let me uh, <laughs> let me you know start telling everybody that hey you know what all yeah, you have yeah. to do is stop doing this to yourself and and it'll be great and, and you know and if I'm an effective salesman with some charisma I'll you know really be able to to do this or if I you know master the satsang you know technique you know like talking very gently softly you know, <laughs> and you know wear the appropriate clothes and you know have the regal chair and the flowers and the glass of water next to you and i mean you know if you if you're convincing at that you could tell someone you know that that's what that that's what it is that's what enlightenment is mm -hmm. it you know happen. but i see so many people um or here i guess probably or read on facebook <laughs> you know so many people claiming to have had that that instantaneous permanent experience of awakening and yet they're so angry yeah very good point um so angry about people who don't get it yet so angry about organized religion what so so concerned about what other people believe um and i and i think okay that's egoic constriction from someone who's complaining or saying that I don't have an ego anymore. You know, I've let go of all of that. And, you know, that was really what led to Jeff and Scott and I wanting to do this talk was to say, is there a change in behavior that we could see that you would expect from someone who, you know, was who had become awakened or enlightened? Um, you know, is there a gradual, is there a kind of relaxation of, tension around certain issues is there an openness a flexibility a compassion because a lot of that's missing and it makes me feel like um that a lot of people get this in their heads i mean they get it up here they get the um the intellectual knowing understanding of what non-duality is um far fewer get it in the heart and even fewer is it head and heart and then embodied right you know that they actually living it you know it's knowing it it's feeling it it's living it and um and 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 maybe that's completely natural because maybe that is that first there is a mountain then there is no mountain then there is because if a lot of people are going through a process and saying okay i used to think there was a mountain and now i'm enlightened and i know there is no mountain well, maybe more people would would be at the stage of there is no mountain, there is no mountain, and that's the message. And fewer people would have come back to, you know what, now there is a mountain. The difference is that, you know, is that I just don't take that mountain seriously. It doesn't mean that I don't play on the mountain, climb the, continue to climb the mountain, continue to practice, continue to, you know, live in on the mountain. It's just I don't cling to it. I don't take it seriously the way I did before. It's not life or death. It's not, you know, the mountain is not who I am. It doesn't define me. There's a Tibet, Tibetan proverb, which I've repeated so many times in these interviews that it should probably be the motto of the show, but it's uh, don't mistake understanding for realization. Don't mistake realization for liberation. Yes. And perhaps if we define our terms properly, we could even say don't mistake liberation for enlightenment but i think what's you kind of I think you nailed it there a minute ago uh, about the understanding bit because i think there's a lot of people who 
gain an understanding and it's not merely intellectual because you know the the reality to which it pertains is lived to some extent so there's this kind of um, intuitive uh, connection uh, for the understanding and an intuitive foundation about non-duality but then that is easily in some cases mistaken for the, the full enchilada for, mm -hmm. for, for the realization and you know how it is when whenever anybody uh, understands or believes a thing that they don't live experientially in their bones they tend to become fundamentalist uh, you know, there might have, you know, people pounding on your door from time to time, handing out leaflets who uh, believe a certain thing which they don't fully experience. And for some reason, when, when that happens, people tend to be confrontational or argumentative or to see themselves as in a special position and others in a lesser position, you know, whether it's a Christian context or a non dual context. Um, and you have many amusing little cartoons in your book about that. <laughs> Basically, the little guy with the enlightenment thing going on in his chest. Um, but I think that there's a lot of that going on, in, from what I can see, in the non-dual community, where people gain an understanding, and there's a, there's an intuitive component to it, which makes it somewhat experiential. But it it's really just a taste. It's not the full blown experience, experiential living of non-duality that is possible, and yet they mistake it for that. And then, right. they, then they become sort of sanctimonious and holier than thou and argumentative. I mean, you know, I, this guy Francis Bennett, whom I interviewed a few months ago, very delightful Trappist monk who got awakened in the monastery and then left, and he now gets a couple hundred emails a day since I did the interview with him, but he says there's a lot of people who just see it as their mission to convince him that they are, you know, fully enlightened and and probably more enlightened than he is and so on. So I don't know what's going on with that, but maybe you can <laughs> co co comment. Well, I, I don't know what's going on with it, but I do know what it suggests. And again, this comes back to this whole thing about um, I can't tell you anything about your subjective experience. Right. If you tell me man, Tom, I did this thing, you know, I was meditating and the cosmos opened up and, you know, Buddha himself came down and touched his forehead to mine and said, you are now a god, you are enlightened, you are, you know, you know, I, I mean, I can't argue with that. That's your subjective experience. Um, I can't say it didn't happen. You're full of crap. Uh, you know, I, I can't say really any of that. But what I can say is, how do you behave afterwards? Right. You know, it is within my capacity to look at how you're showing up in the world. Mm -hmm. And if after that experience, you're showing up in the world by, um, you know, being hurtful to people, you know, or if your expression of your enlightenment requires that you put people down, um, you know, make them feel bad about where they are or who they are, um, um, if you're always needing to pick fights, if you're always needing to get someone to understand how enlightened you are, um, <laughs> that suggests that, you know, it suggests that what you experienced was a peak and beautiful experience, but I don't know if it's what we would call enlightenment right. or awakening. Uh, it's an awakening experience, but it's not the awakening <laughs> if, you know. So that begs a really big question, which is, um, you know, just as you can't really refute what a person is experiencing subjectively or reporting to experience subjectively, um, can we with any certainty say that there are certain types of behavior that are characteristic or necessarily uncharacteristic of enlightenment? You know, could an enlightened person be behaving as an SOB and really genuinely be enlightened? Or, and, and where would you draw the line, you know? Yeah, I mean, everything that I'm talking about is like, uh, it, everything I'm talking about is both true and problematic. Right. You know, it's like, I, I think that it's true that it's fair to look at how someone's behaving if they're claiming to be enlightened, if they're claiming to be free of ego, I think it's fair to look at um, the behaviors that we 
kind of associate with egoic clinging or clinging to an egoic identity. On the other hand, um, I think that it's entirely possible that someone um, someone can be doing something that we would look at and say, you know, because of our own triggers, you know, that's a that's a bad thing. Like, you know, I, I guess an example would be I can imagine a, a Zen teacher being harsh in a moment. I can imagine a good teacher faced with a student who's like not getting it, not getting it, you know, recalcitrant, and you're doing the whole, you know, okay, let me, let's try this again another way. And then going, hey, you know, or <laughs> right. smacking you or, you know, knocking the cup out of your hand or something simply to get your attention. Mm -hmm. um, and and there are people watching this, this, you know, this from the outside who could say, well, he's just being mean. It's like you almost can't judge that one little moment without seeing, did, was that person, was that teacher able to, to use that energy in a moment to shift someone, to get them to pay attention, and then was able to let it go? Sure. Or has that become their way of, you know, like, it becomes an identity when that's your only way of addressing it's only, someone. It's the only tool in your toolbox you is being smack obnoxious. It. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then what if we take it a few steps further and, and we have teachers who in many respects seem incredibly enlightened and seem to have a profound influence on people who it turns out were sleeping with their students or who did weird things with their students' money and so on. What do you conclude? And, you know, Ken Wilber kind of comes to the rescue here with his lines of development mm -hmm. where you could have somebody who's, you know, profoundly advanced along the lines of development of consciousness but still has uh, rather undeveloped lines of personal morality or, you know, maturity uh, in certain ways and, and so on. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think it makes some sense to say... Um, you know, if you want to, I mean, if I want somebody to fix my car, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm going to go to somebody who's mastered the ability to fix cars. Right. Um, you know, but I'm not going to expect that person uh, to be a concert musician, or I'm not going to expect them to have a certain, I don't know, a certain level of, you know, skill or expertise in other areas. Yeah, but there's a difference there because fixing cars is a particular relative skill. Yeah. Uh, it's just a very you know particular channel of of some type of knowledge th that you've learned. Whereas supposedly enlightenment is such a fun fundamental thing that it's like the ground from which all you know plants uh, rise, and you would expect all the plants to be healthy uh, planted in such a ground. But when you find that you know the ground seems to be fertile and yet this plant over here is withering, you begin to wonder if there's really such a tight correlation between development of consciousness and, and behavioral issues. Yeah. I also wonder though if part of this this problem isn't the transplanting of Eastern um, hierarchical kinds of lineage traditions into Western culture. Because, and again, I'm not a a, a scholar and I couldn't tell you you know what the incidence of this was this kind of event you know sleeping with students or things like that uh, what the incidence of that was 200 years ago um, but when you start bringing those teachers who traditionally lived in uh, you know in ashrams in you know relatively poor you know com communities um, and you bring those teachers to the West, and now all of a sudden you've got a completely different dynamic. You've got a completely different relationship. Um, you bring a kind of monastic tradition that used to take sex off the table by separating men and women, and you know having monasteries and you know for for men monasteries for women, and there was a separation there. Um, uh, you know a lot of that used to be kind of taken off the table, and now it's not. 
Um, yeah, I mean, and, and also the culture itself is sexually modest and conservative and so on, the Indian culture in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and um, then you get, you know, these guys coming over the West and women are dressed in, you know, hot pants or whatever. I mean, I'm not, and I'm not blaming the women here, uh, but it's, it's a culture shock and it could perhaps present them with temptations they didn't realize they still harbored. Right. Or that their, that their religious tradition was in no way, had no way prepared them for. Right, right, right. Because yeah. if you don't ever have to deal with women, you know, and, you know, in your cultural upbringing, you know, if you grew up in the monastery, you know, and then to be faced with that here. Yeah. I mean, that is different. Or, you know, what if you grew up in a Western culture and then, you know, went the Buddhist, uh, you know, Buddhist route and became a priest and, and those things, um, you know, it's kind of like which moral code or which tradition are you, are you going to end up following in a way? Yeah. There's another thing which I think is that um, I think maybe some of these people have begun to question whether the monastic path they had followed was actually all that necessary. Mm -hmm. and and decided that hey you know maybe I should have some more relative experiences that um, I've been depriving myself of all these years and I, it's not going to matter to me at this stage of my development or you know if people are coming to me with problems that have to do with their relationships and I've never had one yeah maybe <laughs> I should do my homework <laughs> <laughs> no. and, and, and I think there's probably another thing that may be um, that this may address is the fact that maybe there's something about this that we as students create in our teachers. Um, maybe it's something we need. You know, maybe we need, because of where we are developmentally, we need to have these kind of challenges where we, um, you know, it's put in our face that we put people up on pedestals and then they come down. Right. Um, you know, I, I've i seen firsthand in, you know, in probably kind of shamanic, in the shamanic spiritual community where there's a, there's a constant race to find someone who's more authentically indigenous. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, you know, you could have a teacher who was, you know, born in the West, raised in the West, studied, you know, shamanic traditions and is a great teacher and is actually, you know, an amazing shaman on their own. Um, but they will always be trumped by someone who comes from an indigenous culture. Whatever their moral, ethical, you know, uh, shortcomings may be, they'll be trumped simply by the fact of the color of their skin or their ethnicity or their, you know, their lineage. And then, and then the one who is, you know, has is least discovered will trump that one. Mm. You know, it's like the well, I know a guy from further up the mountain. <laughs> I know a guy you know, for deeper in the jungle. And, you know, so it, there's a, I saw kind of again and again, um, you know, we, we go after this and then you, and then in, when you're in a spiritual community around a teacher, there is a desire to get closer to the teacher. Mm -hmm. And frankly, you use whatever you have to bring to the table. Um, I know, you know, I mean, I did an apprenticeship with a, a Peruvian shamanic teacher for a number of years, and I wanted, like everybody else, to be closer to him than the other students were. And I had the gift of being able to um, organize his written materials and, you know, help him develop a book around his material, which was something he really wanted to do. And I used my skill to get close to him. Um, I saw women use their sexuality mm -hmm. to get close to him. Um, you know, I was doing, you know, they were doing nothing that was any more <laughs> egoic or, you know, they were doing nothing more wrong than I was doing in a sense, just trying to get close to him. Um, but there was a lot of judgment, you know, from other people in the community that, you know, that was wrong. Yeah. You know, it was wrong what he did you know, almost more than wrong what, you know, 
I, I don't know. It, no, I know what you. I know what you're saying. And and the, well, and the use of the word wrong reminds me of the, how relative a term that is, and how culturally uh, conditioned it is. I mean, if you if you give any authority to the Vedic tradition, uh, you know, and you read the stories of Krishna, who is supposed to be incarnation of God. He was constantly doing things that would blow your mind. I mean, the whole Mahabharata war was won on the basis of deception and subterfuge. He would tell, you know, he would tell uh, the the warriors to do things that violated the codes of of ethics of the that that day. And he had all kinds of things going on with all kinds of women. And <laughs> and uh, you know, so I don't know. I mean, all those Puranas, all of that 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 literature is meant to blow your mind. They they kind of get you thinking a certain way, and then they swing it back in the other direction, and you you end up kind of having a really hard time forming firm judgments about anything. Well, but maybe that's maybe that's why we have these teachers in our lives. Yeah. You know, yeah. maybe that's what we what we need to learn right now. Yeah. In any case, I would say, perhaps in conclusion to this this particular point is. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, take what you need and leave the rest. Yeah. Uh, if if a teacher does something which you find disillusioning, you know, don't forget all the, the profound benefits you may have derived from that teacher, and you know, appreciate that. And maybe you move on, maybe you don't. But um, it's not a black and white world, and and no nobody's a black and white person. You know, we all ha we're all kind of mixed bags. <laughs> it yeah. Seems to me. And I would say from the perspective of talking to teachers it's like be honest about your process be honest about where you are you know yeah. and and you know what you're struggling with um because ultimately i find i think that's much more useful it is and and you may run the risk of disillusioning some people who are looking for mr perfect but you'll actually be a much more useful teacher yeah. for the, for those who appreciate honesty Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Um, so I've, I've been, got my iPad here in front of me, and I'm flipping through some of the slides in your presentation. Um, maybe we can talk about some of them. Um, <laughs> I don't know. This, we, we sort of covered on some of these themes, but like here's, a, here's an interesting one. Maybe we can riff on this for a second and see if there's anything more to say about it. It's all perfect as it is. Who is it that's suffering? Everything is an illusion. There's no me here and no you. So the fact that I am hitting you with a stick cannot be causing you pain. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, that comes back to this whole, you know, that, that, was, a, that was actually a, a piece from the book where I was talking about uh, the, um, from the, the perspective from this side of enlightenment, which is, right. you know, when you have that peak experience and you're so sure that's enlightenment, and you're so sure you know what all of this means. <laughs> um, yeah, um, well, you you have a real cute thing in here. Take the non-dual challenge, you, and you have a picture of a grandmother and grandfather. <laughs> so you see, Nana, Ramana Maharshi said, there is no Nana. Your whole life is an illusion. Now, doesn't that feel better? <laughs> well, that, I mean, my, my challenge there was um, you're going to have these peak experiences, but before you, you know, <laughs> Here's, I can't see it because of the lighting. I was going to show a picture of Nana. <laughs> um, you're going to have these peak experiences, and they're going to feel profound, um, and and you're going to feel called to, you know, get your Facebook page set up, and you know, and start yeah. talking about your enlightenment. Well, before you, um, you know, before you start sharing with the world how enlightened you are, the the challenge was um, explain it to your grandparents. Explain exactly. it to your parents, but but the ch the real challenge is explain it to them in a way they get, mm -hmm. which means you have to get away from the quotations. It means you have to get away from the the truisms and the cliches, and you have to find a language that really would communicate with someone where they are. And if you're willing to do that, you know, then by all means, go out and tell the world about you know what you've learned from your experience and that might mean not talking to them about it at all you know yeah. just just being a good grandson and uh, you know maybe if they have health problems taking care of them and uh, you know giving them making them some soup or just being a decent person uh, or, being, or being present with them yeah just being you know, loving just, being present yeah. being there giving them what they want in that moment yeah I think a, a key point here is that um, 
there are many levels of reality, and they are paradoxically uh, opposed to one another if you if you juxtapose them. So for, um, but each has its own relevance on its own level. Mm -hmm. And in terms of physics, you know, quantum mechanics is very different than Newtonian physics. And but the quantum physicist can't go jumping off buildings just because, on uh, uh, to his level of understanding, Newtonian physics has been transcended. Right. Newtonian physics still works on its own level, and, and that's. This it kind of parallels what's happening in the spiritual dimension, which I think, uh, you know, the non-dual world and the principles that we can speak about from that level do not does not necessarily apply to more manifest levels. It may have an impact if you're living it, but there, you know, this whole thing of there's no one home and nothing to do. That's absolutely true on that level, but there are levels on which there is someone home and there is something to do. Right. Um. Yeah, uh, um, yeah. The um, I think another one of the the little cartoons from the book has, uh, um, you know, ha has a, a guy with a briefcase going off to work, and somebody else is looking at him saying, you know, um, you know, I've seen through the need to do anything or be anything, you know, unlike you, um, you know. And by the way, can I sleep on your couch? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, and then there's a little piece of text underneath it that talks about the fact that, you know, Buddhism, you know, was kind of largely designed around the idea that some people are going to give up a lot of comfort, you know, and 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 live off the the largesse of their community to do spiritual work on behalf of their community, um, but they do it in a way that doesn't manage to insult the people who <laughs> they're expecting to live off of. Yeah, they don't come off as holier than thou, hopefully, or you know, yeah. should, they shouldn't anyway. And you know, the, these people are are to have chosen an inferior path to mine, and, and right. so on. Right. Um, well, here's some good points from your presentation on, along those lines. Um, do you use non-duality? How do you use non-duality? Does it reinforce your spiritual identity? Does it make you feel superior? Does it allow you to avoid intimacy and connection? Does it allow you to avoid and distance yourself from the messiness of life? And, you know, we were talking earlier about whether there really are any criteria of enlightenment that could be uh, overtly observed, objectively observed. Um, you know, these, a sense of holier than thouness and aloofness and so on and so forth, we can observe those in people. And if, if that's the, um, if that's the symptom of their non-dual realization, then then maybe we we're justified in uh, questioning its legitimacy. Yeah, I also think there's something else interesting going on. You know, that those questions bring up for me, and that is that, um, you know, in the perfect non-dual world, there you know there's only one. There is no duality. Um, but in the world that we live, there are, you know dualities and and one of the big dualities is a kind of we ascribe a kind of masculine set of values and feminine set of values as either ends of a, a pole a, a scale and you know Ken Wilbur calls it um, you know the masculine agency and feminine communion um, as defining either ends of those spectrums you know that the the masculine in, in any of us associates with emptiness, with at with freedom, and the feminine in any of us associates with uh, um, with love and connection and um, fullness as opposed to emptiness. So, um, you know, so you take these beings who have or are somewhere on this spectrum of masculine and feminine at any moment, and you give them a peak experience, and you know, the more masculine you are, the more your experience is liable to be of emptiness, and actually the bliss of emptiness. Um, and the more feminine you are, you're more likely to experience the the bliss of fullness, the bliss of oneness, being one with everything, connected to part of everything. Um, and you know, and it may be that. It, you know, also non-duality is a very kind of much more masculine feeling tradition, you know, because it is about, um, you know, the emptiness and the elimination, you know, all form is illusion. It's, you know, none of that stuff matters. Um, and yet, 
to the feminine in all of us. You know, the form is beauty. The form is what changes. The form is what makes this experience so rich and so powerful. So in those questions that I ask about, you know, how do you use non-duality? Um, I know a lot of men use non-duality or more masculine people use non-duality as a way of kind of justifying avoiding intimacy, <laughs> yeah. justifying avoiding the feminine messiness of life. Um, use it to kind of control their more feminine partners in relationship, um, you know, and get them to think more like a man. Why can't a woman be more like a man? <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> my fair lady. Yeah, the the ultimate, uh, um, the 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 ultimate masculine, you know, thing. But of course, if we got women to be more like men, intellectually, we would that would be really good for us. But we would not be attracted to them. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> it would not be nearly as attractive uh, yeah. for them to be like us. Um, and yet, you know, I, so I, you know, those are questions for me that I think are are kind of interesting. Um, it's very interesting. Yeah, I was a student of Maharshi Mahesh Yogi for many years, and I remember him one time saying um, that according to the your makeup, according to the the nature of your nervous system, when when the absolute is realized, whatever term we want to use there, uh, it's going to be experienced quite differently and expressed quite differently. So one person, it might be predominantly a, a, an experience of vastness and another more bliss mm -hmm. and um, another kind of more devotion, bhakti kind of thing. And in fact, even in terms of like you know the the, the whole non-dual versus bhakti argument um, he he said at one time point that it's really up to the devotee and his god that some people would choose to just have complete unity and merge and there's no devotee and anything to be devoted to and others would pr prefer to maintain that separation for the sake of devotion and he said it's uh, you know really has to do with your constitution and your makeup so it's all the same reality we're plugging into but variety is a spice of life and there's going to be many many different reflections of it it's not going to all look the same yeah i, I think that you know the way ken wilber talks about it mm -hmm. where there's a a first person a second person and a third person experience of the divine you know right. um and you know that first person experience of it is you know i am god i you know I, there is no there's there's no duality i you know i am one with everything or i am the inherent emptiness that is everything um and then there's the second person which is the relationship with the beloved and and there's the third person which is the relationship with the the cosmic um you know sense out there you know of which i'm a part but you know but it's seeing the you know the the indigenous kind of cosmos of spirits in trees and the the animacy of of all life um uh you know i think there's something beautiful about each of those yeah and when you jump to one and say you know this is the only one and you're dismissive <laughs> of the others mm -hmm. i think there may be something that you're missing yeah uh, it's a fundamental fundamentalism rearing its ugly head again you know yeah it's a human it goes deep i mean we're all prone to it i've certainly had my phases but um I think the more you can appreciate the uh, the diversity, I mean, and recognize that one size does not fit all. <laughs> well, but through that, through the idea of finding the beloved, you know, finding God in the other, in that second person, um, you know, I think you learn something valuable about being in relationship with other human beings yeah. that you don't get from the it's all we're all one you know that there there's no you know there's no separate self right. um that may be true is true i'm not saying it's not true but you the, but there is something useful in 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 understanding the finding the god in the beloved in the other in another person um there is something useful in finding that capacity to see that or experience the divine as nature, as cosmos, as a world, you know, that we are part of, as opposed to being, I am the world. And incidentally, I would, I would suggest that um, these different things you just outlined, quoting Ken, would uh, not necessarily be strict classifications for different people, but they could actually be phases that one person would move 
between yeah. even even within a matter of hours i mean you might be sitting having a transcendent all is one experience and then come out and have dinner with your family and you know exactly. be interacting with you know god and the other and so on and, and and i think that's the danger of what you called fundamentalism a, a while ago was that when you latch on to one of them and say this is the only true one yeah you there is something that you're missing right and it and it kind of handicaps you in a way it handicaps you in terms of living in this realm mm -hmm. uh you know and and it forces you to create artificial circumstances like monasteries or caves on mountaintops in order to eliminate the kind of stimulus um, um, you know that's going to impact your belief system in the one right way yeah and you know just to play devil's advocate i would i would say that it's perfectly legitimate for some people to live in monasteries or caves on mountaintops you know that's the right thing for them at that time right. in their in their development. I wouldn't say that everybody should be in the marketplace. No, no. But the, I, yeah, again, I'm I'm not advocating that there's anything right or wrong with that. But I know that the majority of people that, are not suited for it. Well, whether they're suited for it or not, they're not living that. Right. They're living a and and where the problem is that they're living a philosophy mm. that's designed for that in a world that doesn't, you know, it's like that's not supporting that. Ah, very good, yeah. Huh. Interesting. The person I just interviewed yesterday, Rose Rosetree, who was saying something similar. She was saying that, you know, there's, it's, it's almost as though there's householder enlightenment and recluse enlightenment, and some people are kind of caught in the middle trying to live recluse enlightenment in a householder world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I think that's, that's a beautiful way of getting at exactly what I've, you know, what interests me yeah. <laughs> about all of this uh, um, is that you know it's not something we talk about a whole lot. Right. Let me flip through a few more of your slides here. They're a nice grist for the mill. Um, <laughs> you talk about grades of ignorance: simple, not knowing <laughs> that you don't know; uh, volitional, not wanting to know that you don't know; uh, dogmatic, believing you know, believing others do not know; refusing to entertain the possibility that you do not know. Uh, yeah, I, and I got a, I, I've got to credit Stuart Firestein. Actually, he's a, um, a science writer that wrote writes about the idea that science, good science, is actually driven by ignorance. Uh, yeah. And I thought that was such a wonderful term because, you know, we talk in 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 non dual communities. We talk about inquiry mm -hmm. and the importance of inquiry. Well, inquiry should be driven by ignorance, yeah. by an acknowledgement of what you don't know, um, and. And, you know, he said in science, there's both low-grade ignorance and high-grade ignorance. And in low-grade ignorance, he talks about three kinds and that you, you kind of rattle them off. Simple is just, you know, it's just, I don't know something, you know, I don't know something. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, I don't know it yet, so I'm ignorant of it. And there's, uh, you know, it, it's not particularly useful. It's just a descriptive word. And then there's volitional where, um, you know, I... Uh, I don't know that I don't know, <laughs> right. um, or I don't I don't want to know. That don't I, want to know. Yeah, don't 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 tell me about it. Yeah. Right. And then you know, then the dogmatic is um, is not only um, it, it takes it a step further. It's you know, I'm convinced that I'm right, and it's impossible that I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, but then you know, what's really useful is what is what he calls high grade ignorance, and that's a kind of embracing with awe and wonder um, everything that you don't know mm -hmm. um, you know facing the world with a kind of um, with a kind of open-hearted ignorance um, you know and the, and the one place it probably disagrees a little bit with you know maybe traditional non-duality is the idea that okay so I embrace that I don't know um, I am okay with the fact that I don't know while still desiring to know yeah and you know some non-duality traditions would say you know that's the you know the problem you have to stop you know wanting to know mm. and yet um i think that's a really hard thing to do is to stop you know is to be faced with a mystery and not want to understand the mystery not want to you know well you know if a teacher were speaking to an audience and and were to convey that point to them 
that you know about not you should give up the whole desire to know uh, then if everyone's honest they should just get up and walk out of the room leave him by himself <laughs> because you know, yeah. there's obviously a desire to know that motivated them to come to the talk or yeah. to re read the book or whatever and it's I think that it's innate within all of us at every stage of development there's a natural tendency to desire more and more to uh, more and more knowledge more and more happiness more and more everything it's built into the, the very essence of the universe and we as a, uh, we as expressions of the, very sophisticated expressions of the universe are you know prime examples of it exactly yeah huh um okay flipping through your slides here <laughs> okay you so you had a point about you know enlightenment being instant or gradual permanent or transient independent of practice or supported by practice oneness or emptiness does personality and behavior change remain the same does ego die or does our attachment to identity relax i think yes and no to all those you know yeah, I, yeah. I, I agree uh, Different strokes for different folks. Different, you know, it shows up in different ways. It can be gradual for years, then instant. It can seem to be permanent and yet be lost. I mean, there's so many possibilities. And if and and if as a teacher, if you could say, um, let me tell you what my experience was, with the, with an understanding that my experience may be different than yours. Right. Um, you know, in a way that you could really convey. Uh, I think that's fine. I mean, I think it's fine that there are those distinctions. I think where we get into problems is when when people have an experience and assume that that is their experience is the one and right experience. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I find le it less and less convincing that enlightenment is an, a single moment uh, uh, that's a permanent on-off switch. Um, where everything you know everything changes and you 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 never go back and um i'd have to say in terms of my experience that um there's naturally going to be fluctuations mm -hmm. but uh there's a certain certain baseline st stable thing that has grown and grown and grown over the years and doesn't right. seem doesn't seem to fluctuate now if I got captured by the KGB and injected with all kinds of weird drugs and put in an isolation chamber, who knows what would end up happening to me. I could be back me more messed up than I was when I was 17. So I don't know how stable stable is, but in terms of the life I live, there is I think by stable, what I'm talking about is, you know, what you're describing is a, um, you had, a, you had a, a, a momentary experience that was powerful and something seemed to shift for you in that moment and and that shift held mm -hmm. um but then but in the holding of that shift there was like okay so now there's a whole different set of things i've got to adjust to from this new place that i'm at and i think that's probably a really honest and um, and probably a pretty accurate description of how it happens. But there are people who talk about, um, you know, I mean, there are, there are people who talk about, you know, just, um, just let me take you through this process where I'm going to point out to you that there's nothing there and, you know, and that you're completely empty and a switch will go off and you will then be awake. And, and there is no going back you know and and you're done basically you're you'll you'll be cooked you'll be finished yeah i wonder what their their students track record really is people who are saying that well <laughs> um I, you know i've seen discussions where people try and get at that and uh -huh. i've seen people who've been through that and said it was really profound and um and something really did change for me and six months 12 months later i realized that as as much as I wanted to believe I was done, I wasn't done, mm -hmm. and you know. But it took me time to understand that I wasn't done, just because of the the profound nature of the experience. It felt like this was so profound that how could be that how could there be anything else? One right. and two, the dogma, you know, the the story that went along with the experience was that um, there is no other experience after this. There's just this. Yeah. And it could take a while before reality breaks through that <laughs> that conviction, <laughs> yeah. but, it w but it will break through. Eventually, yeah. yeah. 
I think one thing to throw into the mix is that when we're talking about enlightenment and all this, we're not just talking about a subjective state. We're talking about a physiological state. I mean, everything we experience, everything, every sound we hear and smell we smell and sight we see, it, there's something going on in the brain mm. and, and in the nervous system. And if enlightenment is really as radical a transformation of our subjective experience as it's purported to be, there must be a radical transformation in the way the, the brain is working. Yeah. And there has been a lot of research on that, actually, and they, they are finding out some interesting things. But if that's, if that's true, then your brain does, just doesn't radically transform overnight. And it takes a while for the physiology to adapt and change and you know, new neural pathways to be established and so on. Yeah, and I, and I think that's what, you know, probably not as elegantly, but you know, when I'm talking about this idea that there's a knowing you know, like I can intellectually grasp what this is, but then there's a movement down into my heart. It's like, can I, can I, you know, can I actually feel what this is? And then there's an embodiment, you know, can I actually live this? Um, you know, maybe it's the, you know, when I, when I get it up here, um, I know, uh, um, I, it's, I, I know what should happen. And then the the more it becomes embodied, or the you know, I'm actually able to live, you know, what <laughs> live that understanding in the world, in my yeah. relationships with other people, in my, um, you know, just how I am, mm -hmm. and, and that I'll, becomes behavior. Exactly. Yeah. And I'll bet that um, you know I don't know if any scientists are, have the sophistication to measure it, but I'll bet that as you go through those stages from just knowing to embodiment that there are physiological changes taking place which theoretically could be measured and it might also have to do with subtle physiology you know which couldn't be measured by EEGs but you know things going on with chakras and nadis and shushumna and all this stuff that the eastern mystics uh, you know in, yeah. in, in that terminology there's there's a whole mechanism I mean we could talk about auras and the, the whole deal there there's a whole subtle mechanism to the physiology both on the on the level of meat and on the level of you know yeah. su subtler stuff and I think that all gets rearranged in the process of evolution toward enlightenment and realization mm -hmm. yeah I mean people are free to disagree with that but that's my orientation <laughs> and um, well I won't be disagreeing with you okay and so this state and stage thing, uh, just to, to wrap that up, um, you know, by state we mean, I suppose, permanency, and by stage we mean, you know, stepping stones on the way to permanency. Um, well, actually... Um, or what? Yeah, I would use it again in a more Ken Wilberian um, sense that a state change is something that you have access to at any time. Um, it's a like you can shift of, shift your awareness into yeah. the transcendental depths right. or something. Yeah, change your state of consciousness, and okay. you can you can you can have it at any time, and you and it can feel profound, and you can you can have it from any stage of consciousness mm -hmm. um, that you've developed or whatever stage you're at, um, and you're going to interpret that state based on whatever stage of consciousness you're at, mm -hmm. and um, so. And I think part of the, you know, the, the instant enlightenment phenomenon is, is actually mistaking a change in your state of consciousness for a change in your stage of consciousness. And mm -hmm. stage is what you talk about when you say, well, when you describe, and I'm putting words in your mouth, but when you um, implied a kind of state change that led to a stabilization mm -hmm. at a different level than you were before, that's a state that's leading to a change in your stage exactly consciousness um and i mean I, I think that makes sense but i think it's also possible that you can have a change of your state of consciousness that doesn't affect that doesn't increase or stabilize your stage of consciousness or it can at least it, not perceptibly i mean you know yeah. or, sig or significantly or it can it can suggest what the next stage of consciousness is but you may not be ready for that Right. Or it can elevate you to another stage of consciousness, but there's still work to be done to become stable in that stage. Sure. I would say that, in my experience, that states um, lead to st states uh, 
develop stages. In other words, multiple exposures to a state do have an imprint and an influence uh, that can eventually stabilize into a stage. They, they, I think they can, mm -hmm. um, but I also know that people who've had a lot of exposure to, um, to altered states of consciousness through uh, plant spirits or drugs or things like that um, may be no closer to changing their stage of consciousness. So I don't think it's an always True. And in fact, they might be further because there's certain ways you might change states which actually might be deleterious or damaging and, and you might end up having to repair that damage before getting on to, you know, yeah. pro progressing further, as I can attest from my teenage drug years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, there's another analogy I thought of while you were talking a, a few minutes ago which about this whole experience of states and stages, which is like, you know, we can have a delicious meal, for instance. And it's fantastic, and, and we feel so satisfied. But within a few days, within a few hours, but maybe let's say a day or so, we're going to be hungry again. Mm -hmm. We're still going to remember that meal and think, whoa, that was awesome. Um, now, we haven't totally lost the effect of that meal. It's gone into, you know, been converted into nutrients and gotten into our blood and is making muscle and bone and so on. But you have to keep eating. And um, you know, you and you do, and some meals are better than others. You know, some are kind of bland, and some are delicious. But you keep eating, and over time, your body grows. You know, you become an adult. So, all these different experiences that a person can have, and, and you wouldn't cling to it. You, you wouldn't say, "Oh man, I had the most fa fantastic Thanksgiving dinner when I was 10 years <laughs> old with my family, and I'm just gonna like put a picture of that on the wall and <laughs> worship it." Uh, but you know, you, you, might, you might cling to it. You might, um, and you might compare, you know, future Thanksgiving dinners or other dinners with that one, and they never measure up. Which would but, create your own suffering. Yeah, but if you're sensible, then you know you just keep keep moving along and eating your meals, and and your your body grows. So I think I think this is kind of a useful metaphor for this whole spiritual thing. Uh, because there's all kinds of experiences we can have and there's experiences others have and we might be envious of those and so on but if you just have the attitude of it's all uh, it's all good and it's, it's you know these are all sort of pieces of the puzzle and there it's culturing something that is very profound and, and you have patience and um, keep on trucking yeah it's a good way to, to live yeah just to throw another metaphor in there, because I love metaphors, um, uh -huh. is sometimes when you have that peak experience, something actually does shift inside you. And it's like your center of gravity shifts. Yeah. And and then after the experience, what you realize is that everyone who, in a way, orbited your center of gravity, everyone that you've been in relationship with, um, is now having to adjust to your having a different center of gravity. and mm -hmm. Some relationships are going to fight that shift of your center of gravity. They're not going to like it. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be pressure to say, we want the old Rick back. Mm -hmm. You know, we want the, the center of gravity we've gotten comfortable with because this is really uncomfortable for us. And there's a lot of pressure to, you know, um, you know, I mean, ideally, your center of gravity would shift, you know, to kind of a higher level and everyone would be real supportive of that and your culture would be real supportive of that. And, you know, we'd have this smooth transition. But sometimes, you know, that stabilizing at that, in that, that center of, new center of gravity isn't supported by our culture. It's not supported by our close relationships even. And there's a real big tendency to go back to, you know, let me go back. Mm -hmm. So it's not always even that the person themselves, you know, simply is incapable of holding a, a, a transformation from a state change. Sometimes it's it's what's going on around them. It takes a lot of energy to, you know, to maintain yeah. that center, that new center of gravity. There's an old Bengali saying that if if no one comes on your call, then go ahead alone. And uh, and and there, you know, many spiritual traditions advocate keeping the company of the wise. You know, yeah. and I know in my own case, when I first learned to meditate, um, within a week I had pretty much dropped all my druggy friends, and I just spent a couple of months doing my own thing, walking the dog, and, and you know, got back into school, and, and eventually I built a whole new circle of associates <laughs> yeah. who had more wholesome uh, tastes. Um, but I think, you know, I've seen a lot of people submit to peer pressure, and, and it can hold you back. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Okay, so I'm just flipping through some more of your stages, your slides here. Uh, <laughs> just hoping I haven't changed my mind about anything since I made that presentation. <laughs> yeah, it was a good presentation. Um, there are a lot more things here. I think we've covered a lot of these points. Is um, is there anything that kind of comes to your mind that you customarily have been thinking about or talking about lately that um, that we haven't touched upon? Um, Probably not. I think the you know the thing that still interests me you know right now is this whole um, what is the embodiment process you know what is the what is the going from you know I, I liked your your terminology the um, the the realization to liberation and not confusing them and right right um, you know, not con not confusing understanding understand. for realization and not confusing realization, which I guess we could mean some kind of opening or awakening for liberation. Right, which yeah. is you know which is to live unfettered, right? Know, to live in the moment of of the moment, to live with what arises. Um, you know, I'm I'm actually doing some some writing right now around the idea of improvisation, mm -hmm. um, and the idea that one of the places that our suffering comes from primarily is that we walk around with these scripts we're all script writers and we've written these screenplays and and a big part of our lives is getting people to play the parts we've written for them <laughs> in our scripts yeah. and nobody wants to play the role we want them to have written that because they're writing their own scripts and they're you know sometimes we make accommodations and we say will you play the part I've written for you yeah if you'll play the part I have written for you okay well maybe we get together and be a couple or be best friends or something like that because we, we both created this agreement um, but a lot of our suffering comes from the fact that we're not you know we're not playing the role correctly um, and I've been thinking about this, you know, so, you know, would, it, would real enlightenment, real um, a kind of awakening or be the capacity to let go of the script and improvise with what shows up, with who shows up? Um, and, you know, I, I got a bit of a background in theater and in improvisational theater, um, what makes great improvisation is when you don't say no to what shows up. Um, it's when you say, it's when you say, okay, let me work with what whatever has shown up, um, you know. And and then, and again, it's not to say that you don't ever say no to what shows up in in your life. But if you want to keep the because in improvisation, if someone comes into an improvisation, let's say you and I were improvising that we were duck hunters in a blind, you know, in a duck blind waiting for ducks and a third character came into the improvisation as a cheerleader. You know, they <laughs> would scare away the ducks. Well, the part of us would go, well, no, that doesn't fit with our duck scenario here. You know, <laughs> go back and come, become, come back something else. Um, and so we would stop it and the improvisation would stop right there and, and we would create suffering, be, you know, be, in that moment. But on the other hand, if we could, you know, look at each other and go, just what we needed because our morale was beginning to flag. We weren't shooting any ducks. We need someone to get our morale up. So we embrace the cheerleader, you know, who, who shows up and we, and we move on. Um, you know, in, in the world of improvisation, players are considered good improvisational players based on um, how generous they are. Mm. It's like, what do they give you to work with? And the best players, improvisationally, are the people who are most generous. Hmm. They give you the best stuff to work with. Huh. Um, well, you know, on this theme, uh, if, in, I mean, you, you kind of just presented this as a characteristic, perhaps, or a symptom of enlightenment, this being able to, you know, go with the flow and, and, and be in, improvisational. Um, if we acknowledge that... Uh, or if if we sort of recognize that there's a vast intelligence that's orchestrating the universe, and if 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 tuning into that intelligence is a, is a characteristic or aspect of enlightenment, then it seems to me that people are naturally going to um, begin to recognize that what shows up is showing up for a reason. That there, it's not just arbitrary or capricious. There's some sort of intelligence, there's some lesson in it for you. You know, like the world is my guru. 
And uh, I've heard humility defined as the quality of not insisting that things happen any particular way. Yeah. And if we if we equate humility with diminution, uh, reduction of ego, uh, you know, and just sort of let go and let God bumper sticker kind of thing, then it all kind of fits together. And and I think a person who's quote unquote enlightened is naturally going to be very um, adaptable mm -hmm. and a lot, you know, kind of forgiving and allowing of. Uh, s s taking things in stride, you know, and, and act, behaving accordingly rather than uh, railing against the course of events and, and, and trying to go against the flow. Boy, I'm using a lot of cliches in there. <laughs> Spinning it out as I speak. No, but I think you're, you know, I, I think that's what, basically that's what I'm talking about um, with improvisation. Um, uh, I'm just always curious about is, is there a you know a metaphor or a fresh way of talking about it that yeah that gets through to people in a different way and um and I suppose you could say it's really a matter of going with the flow um because in a certain ex you know to a certain extent that's you know that's what you're describing in improvisation but um but there's also an active component you know improvisation isn't passive just right. waiting to see what happens you play a role and and you play a game. You play the game of moving this forward. Mm -hmm. We're all, you know, we're all moving this game forward by what we're by what we're saying, by our actions. Um, so it's not like we're sitting on a cushion because that's a bad improvisational player as well. Because then someone comes on and says, "I'm a cheerleader," and you go, "Oh, okay." Well, I'm well, fighting you... it, but I'm not in a way moving it, moving this forward. When we use the phrase go with the flow, it kind of presents it from the individual perspective that there's this river of life flowing and we're going to cooperate with it. But really, we are that river. Right. And, and uh, you know, so we are the flow. And rivers can be very powerful. They can cut through mountains. They made the Grand Canyon, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so that kind of, uh, they, they can be anything. They can be far from passive. And, and, you know, and the other, the reason for the metaphor of improvisation is that you can be passionate in an improvisation yeah you can be completely um you know to all outside appearances you can be completely devoted to a thing happening mm -hmm. to getting something to happen um which is like life you know you can be you can want to save the planet you can want to solve a pressing problem um but in the moment that the improvisation ends in a way you let it go yeah and then if it's a new improvisation you pick that back up again and you're passionate um you know so it it kind of offers an opportunity that's not this dispassionate non-duality where yeah. you don't care about anything so that again you won't be connected to anything you won't feel pain or something like that yeah, now in improvisation you play the game with everything you've got it's simply that you realize a part of you realizes you're in a game and when the game is done you set it down yeah krishna urges arjuna to go ahead and fight the battle but he has a smile on his face the whole time mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and uh i've told this story before but in, you know ama the hugging saint she she has all these huge projects and feeding the hungry and orphanages and hospitals and building tsunami homes and all this stuff always driving and pushing these things and at one point one of her Swami said to her, yeah, what, 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 what more can we do for the world? And she said, what world? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> just, to, just to kind of mess with his head. Be, so, you know, so a person can be fully cognizant of the ultimate unreality of, of the world. And, you know, it, it really is an illusion on, from some perspective. But that does not necessarily mean and shouldn't mean that you're not going to be passionate about trying to improve it. Exactly. Good. So I don't want to have the last word here. That's a, a kind of nice note to end on. But there's, is there anything finally you'd like to say in conclusion? Um, it's been fun. Yeah. It, it's been a great conversation, and I'm I'm glad for the opportunity, and glad you gave me the chance. Great. Well, as soon as I saw you open your mouth at the sand conference, I thought, whoa, this guy's interesting. <laughs> I'd like to talk to him. <laughs> well, maybe we have to figure out a way to uh, to attach the the slides to the um, <laughs> so that other people could. 
yeah we're flipping through that would be a bit of editing work but uh we could do a thing if you wished where i could uh, make the pdf of it available and people could download that um, yeah that that would be fine yeah i think that's what you sent me wasn't it a pdf yeah, I did. okay so I'll, I'll link to the pdf from you know your interview page on that gap and people can download it and look through the slides great great good so let me make a couple of brief concluding remarks um for those who've been listening or watching uh, this is uh this interview has been part of an ongoing series. I do a new one about once a week. And uh, if you'd like to be notified of new ones, just uh, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and there's a little tab there that you can click on to put in your email address, and you'll get an email every time I put up a new interview. And you'll also see all the ones I've done archived. And uh, there's a chat group that builds up around each interview, so Tom's page will have its own little chat group that that people can participate in to discuss what we've discussed here uh, there's also an audio podcast and there's a link to that with each interview so that if you wish you can subscribe to the podcast and listen to this on your iPod um, there's also a, a donate button which I very much appreciate people clicking on every now and then but there's no obligation and uh, I'll also be linking to Tom's website from there uh, and what is your website, Tom? Um, uh, www.onedropawareness.com, I think. <laughs> okay, onedropawareness.com. Yeah. So I'll be linking to that anyway from my website, and and um, people want to you know check it out and get in touch with Tom or whatever. That's how you can do it. So thank you, Tom. Thank you, those who've been listening or watching, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.